Mhm. 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 It's not going to happen. You're not going to just mm-hmm the whole time. It'd be so much fun. I already failed. How are you feeling? We're on two weeks of being sick. Two weeks. Yeah, I've never had this happen in a very long time. Actually, okay. I don't remember the last time I've been this sick. Two weeks of illness. Yeah. Bacterial infection moved on to the regular viral infection. Nice. I know. Okay. And what's left is COVID. COVID refuses to catch me, though. Yeah, you don't have that. No, because it, it just doesn't want me. Right. <laughs> Though I've been exposed many, many I, times. I, I don't want you to feel wounded by that. No, okay. it's totally fine. Yeah. I don't. Not that I need it. Right, right. I just, I feel like I have, you know, I've been getting everything else. I, I don't want you to feel like that is an affront to your dignity or anything. like That I'm not wanted. Yeah, I feel exactly. rejected. Exactly. I've been abandoned. I have feelings of guilt and shame. I don't shame. want you to feel like disease is rejected. Hopelessness you know? and powerlessness. I've been rejected by so many other places in my <laughs> life. Now disease itself <laughs> is rejecting me. Yeah, I don't, I don't want that to happen. All right, so because... I was thinking about you being <laughs> sick. Are you okay? You gonna live? We're gonna try. Okay. I can't die until Sunday, apparently. Yeah, I, I've had it easy, just like a, a light cold. Oh, that's right, nice for comparison. you. In comparison, um, but I was thinking about okay, the fact that we we like both both dealing with some small illness at the same time. Yours seriously more serious. Yes, I had a moxicillin at one point. Ooh, they gave you drugs. They gave me drugs. Yeah. <laughs> the, I just the... had to blow my nose a lot. Like it wasn't that bad. I'll get you. That's nice. Yeah. No, but I was, I was thinking about that. Okay. Because it's all happening as we're getting ready for uh, this this big retreat that we've got going on. For, Spiritual for warfare. Women. So physically manifesting. Yeah. No, seriously, that there's like some physical manifestation of it. But also, I think there's there's something to this where, like, I, I realized part of part of the reason that I was getting this cold was just it's been it's been busy and there's a certain feeling of being run down. Mm-hmm. Right. But then I was looking at you. <laughs> And I was looking at how you were still coming in to get as much work done as you could. Even like you had to take a couple of days off here and there to like just yeah, try like to two, recover. Two and a half days. Yeah. But then you were still getting things done. You were still working even from even from home. You're still emailing and texting because we had this retreat coming up. Yes. Very big deal. And I was watching that. And I was like, okay, this is it was very moving for me. In, in a really positive way. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, no, no. I just I need to I need to make sure that it's clear. Like Aww. I was I was watching what you were doing and I was I was really moved by it because it's it's that that sort of gift of self that you were making. Oh, I'm and gonna for cry. The sake of, for the sake of ministry. No, it was great. It was great. I wanna oh. I wanna affirm that. <laughs> you know my love language is words of affirmation. <laughs> yeah. So I I'm very <laughs> serious. I, I wanna I wanna affirm it because I, I saw what you're doing. So, okay, this <clears> is <throat> this is really this is really beautiful and it's really generous of her. Um I had like one part of a day where I just said, I can't, I just can't be here and mm-hmm. I had to go over to the house. Like now I, I, I'm across the parking lot. So it's easy. I just go over there. And mm-hmm. if something really needs to happen. I can come back and take care of it. Mm-hmm. But I said, no, I gotta, I gotta just take, take a little bit of time for rest. And then we started talking the other day a little bit about ministry and I, that's what we're going to talk about on the podcast now today. Yeah. We're going to talk, we're going to talk ministry here because I started realizing you were, you were sacrificing yourself a lot and you're putting extra effort in and all of that stuff, which is, I think, fantastic and a huge gift. And I realized that when we talk about doing ministry, some type of service in the life of the church, very often we, we kind of put ministry all together. All different types of ministry are all related to each other. And there's a truth to that. They are, in fact, going to be all, yep. all related to one another. All for the kingdom. All for the kingdom. Exactly. The goal is the same. Mm-hmm. But the person who is taking on a particular ministry, uh, according to their circumstances, there's going to be something that's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. So what struck me was that for many of us, when we do some type of ministry in the life of the church, the paradigm, the model that we're basing it off of is actually the ministry provided by priests or religious. So a priest by vocation has a uh, a ministry and a way of living out that ministry that's deeply connected to every aspect of his vocation. Mm-hmm. So as a priest, that means uh, there's got to be availability. There's got to be all of these all of these things where you know I live where I minister. <laughs> I, I live here and I live among the people to whom I minister. Uh, there's there's meant to be an availability. At all times, I don't get to uh, put the ministry off to the side. At at some point, uh, the ministry is is part of my my very life because I'm a priest. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing, everything, I, I can't stop being a priest. 
right? Like I can't decide, okay, I'm, I'm off duty. Therefore I'm, I'm not functioning right now as, as priest. I'm, I am priest no matter what. That's why your days off are theoretical <clears throat> days off. Yes. My days off end up being theoretical, but even, okay, we're going to, we're going to come to that though too, because yeah. even like the, the day off thing yeah. for, for a priest, it means a day of rest. It doesn't mean so much a day not being a priest. Right. It's meant to be a day of rest and I need to be better about taking a day of rest. Yes. And I'm, I, I know that you usually only do half days maybe. Maybe. If then. Often. Sometimes. Yes. Infrequently. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But then lay ministry, so a lay person taking on some sort of ministry in the life of the church, their ministry is not theirs by vocation when we consider what what the idea of vocation is. Mm-hmm. So like the call to priesthood, to religious life, to marriage. Right? These are these are the vocations. And then the things that we do, the work that we do, supports our true vocation, the primary vocation. And this is why you see like a, a family can struggle if mom or dad decides to focus too much on their job and not enough on their family. Right. A marriage can Around struggle if the spouses focus too much on the career trajectory and not enough on one another. Mm-hmm. Now, if that's all integrated and if it's understood to be something that's supporting, then we can make we can make anything work. Mm-hmm. We can make it happen with God's grace. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking about you as a lay person doing ministry and the fact that you're spending extra time and sacrificing time when you should be out sick because there's a job to do. There's stuff that we need get to get done. It is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm moved by that because there, there's the generosity, right? There's mm-hmm. the, the generosity that's required if we're going to minister. You know, it doesn't, I don't need generosity in, in heart to, to go and do certain other jobs. Mm-hmm. It sure helps. Right. And like, think, think about how different like a uh, job performance would be if I approached it with a, a real generosity, a Christian generosity of spirit. Gosh. Wow. Right. How, how different could we make workplaces and culture. offices? Right. Yeah. But for me to do this job, like <clears throat> to go and sit in this cubicle doesn't require generosity. Mm-hmm. But if I am generous, it's going to make the job a heck of a lot better. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, in ministry, ministry demands generosity. Yes. Doing something for the life of the church to to share the faith, to teach the faith, uh, to serve people who are in need, to serve the poor, to, to build them up. It requires our generosity. Right. And so you were you were showing me that generosity, when I think, in a really beautiful way. Now, what happens, though, if we model lay ministry in the life of the church on clerical or religious ministry? So the ministry done by priests and religious sisters whose lives are dedicated entirely to God with these works of mercy, these works of whatever being the the manifestation of their Mm -hmm. dedication. The fact that you took vows to do this the rest of your life. Right. Yeah. Right. And so do we sometimes, and I, I, I think we can see this, like do we sometimes expect too much of people working for the church Mm. in terms of their hours, in terms of their availability, Mm -hmm. when that might not be the the right way to go. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So I have a bunch of thoughts. The first one is in this book by Matthew Kelly, Four Signs of a Dynamic Catholic. Um, 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, I guess, in some certain spaces. He jokingly most, says, I think almost all spaces. All spaces. <laughs> he jokingly says, in the church, 92% of the work is done by 8% of the people. So, one, you have a lack of laborers, um, or you just have the select few who get repeatedly asked again and again and again to do the same thing. And so there isn't this, um, the sphere of which you can call upon different people is kind of small. Yeah. Well, it's so, insular. So, so hang on. I'm, I'm talking about lay ministry taken on by people who are doing this as they're, as they're living. Yes. So because of that, because there's a lack of other assistance, a lay minister themselves will take on more than they need to. Okay. And you can get into this. So because there's a a distinction between volunteer ministry and, and paid ministry. Right. Or or compensated ministry maybe is the way to talk about it. So I think it's the job of a paid minister in the church to go and create more people. Otherwise they feel like they have to do it themselves. And that's something that I do. Like in my head, I'm just, oh, I'm just going to get it done. I'm just going to get it done. And before you know it, you're doing so many different things. And this was explicitly pointed out to me two weeks ago when I went to a young adult event and there's a, a board member that I love 
who introduced me to somebody and she was trying to explain to me who I was to this to she was trying to explain who I was to this person and she goes oh yeah she's all about evangelization and she's like uh I want to say maniac but that's not the right word <laughs> and I was You're just like I was like oh but what she saw and what other people have seen me do is like oh you're everywhere yeah you're in this you're in that you're in that part of me is like i can't help it um i just i feel moved by the spirit so then i just like move on in these different spaces but that also says something to me is why am i always in a, in a sense like why do i put so much pressure on myself to get as much done rather than equip and delegate more people yeah. and invite them into that mission with me um because it is it is very different. So, you know, what you do is if you're a lay minister who loves the Lord and you want to live your life for the Lord, in a way, you're already prepared to make sacrifices. And you're told, like, sacrifices are good. Sacrifices are holy. They're going to sanctify you. If you make these sacrifices, you're going to save a soul. And that's motivating. Like, even if you feel empty um, in your emptiness, God can still... Um, maybe that's serving somebody who feels empty in their own heart, in their own life. And um, you are uniting yourself to the cross in that manner. Um, but there's two different kinds of sufferings. There's the one like the Lord asks you, ask, asks of you. But then the, the other one that we impose on ourselves that the Lord never asks us to take. Um, so kind of being cognizant of what is it that I'm taking on um, and where can I invite other people into it? But it's, it's, it's so hard because lay ministers get to a point where there's burnout. Like youth ministers only last 18 months on average. Right. You know, you have that example. Um, because it's not just, you're not just showing in and clocking in from nine to five. It's taking all of you, your emotional health, your mental health, the way that you relate to people. You're in a way constantly on, but you can't do it uh, on your own. So you really need that. You need to have the call from the Holy spirit to live it and to be in it in order to continue to do it. Yeah. Um, but something that I've noticed sometimes too, is people can get so worked up about doing things for Jesus that they start spending less time with Jesus. But I'm doing these things for you, Jesus. Doesn't that count? And then that well, yeah. it's a different, it's another kind of burnout than you experience spiritually. Cause now though you're doing good things for the Lord, are you spending that time with him and allowing right. him to refresh well, the, you? The spiritual burnout comes because you're not praying mm -hmm. because there's not that relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And then the physical burnout, the mental burnout comes because the work is so demanding mm -hmm. and it's taking all your time, all your energy, and you're probably sacrificing more than, more than is either necessary or more than is, is prudent. And it's not regular time. You can't like yeah. every, every season is different. Right. So, all right. This has been talked about on lots of other publications, podcasts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is, th these aren't original thoughts, No. but one thing that you'll see often is the discussion of, uh, let's take Catholic school as an example, mm -hmm. All right? So Catholic schools, primarily in the United States, Catholic schools in the United States are, are unique and distinct from Catholic schools, I think, anywhere else. The whole parochial school system is something that, that we kind of came up with as an actual response in the United States to real need. Uh, and because that was a real need, the, the need was to to have a school that was going to provide a quality education and teach the Catholic faith mm. instead of sending kids to the public schools, which at the time, uh, this is going back now a couple centuries, at the time, the public schools uh, were state schools that taught Protestantism. Mm -hmm. And in fact, were often openly anti-Catholic. Yes. And so for the Catholic students who were coming in, largely the children of immigrants, there needed to be a, a, a way to educate them and to teach them where they would not be exposed to um, hostile hostile attitudes because of their faith. Mm -hmm. So the Catholic schools were, were established. Now, the Catholic schools ended up thriving and doing really well, and so Catholic schools have become kind of famous all around the country for this. But what happens is, is in the late 60s and early 70s, you have a lot of the sisters who taught in those schools leaving their convents um, or deciding to take on new ministries. We need to go, we're gonna serve the poor, we're gonna serve the people on the streets. So they do all of this, and the Catholic schools still exist. But now, let's say 60%, it's probably more than 60%, but let's just, let's start with a lower number. Uh, let's say about 60% of the faculty is no longer available to teach. Mm. What do you do? You have to hire teachers. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden the, 
the teaching that was done by these sisters um, or brothers in those schools that had religious brothers, the, the teaching that was done in those places uh, at a very low cost because the because they lived in community, because they, they lived a simple life, they did not have many expenses. Now suddenly you have to pay lay, lay, lay teachers a living wage. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at Catholic school salaries, it's barely a living wage. Um, we need to do a much better job with that. I don't know. How, I don't know Facts. how to do that because I'm not an economist. But I mean, come on. Like, we we got to figure something out. Like, I don't know what to do. That's and why they don't stay. This is the thing. I have these interior debates in my head where I'm like, we have to do something. I have no idea what to do. We have to do something, but I don't know what to do. We have to do something. I don't know what to do. And I like beat myself up for it. And I should. Ooh, but... I have something of contention that it's an addition to that, but we can continue. Oh no, I think I think we're gonna, both going to come to that. Point. You know what I'm thinking? I think I know exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. Have we're you gonna, been on Facebook lately? Yeah, we're we're gonna. Oh, come you know to exactly. That. We're gonna come. What I'm we're thinking. gonna come to that because right. I because this is I think this is an, a hugely yes, it important is. point. It's yes, a hugely important. It's very point. frustrating. Okay, folks, don't worry. Just yeah, hang we're in. We're gonna there. get hang there. In. We're gonna get there real real soon. Look, we sort of propped up the Catholic school system, mm -hmm. but we didn't we didn't change the paradigm. So. With the times, you mean like? Yeah, and 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 this is just sort of us adjusting to the times. And I think that in a time of a lot of our people, you just try to plug the hole. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what's broken? Let let's at least make it stop being broken. Let's stop the bleeding. Yeah. Um, let's 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 plug the hole that's that's been created, and then we'll figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And we sort of put duct tape over it, and then left the duct tape for forty years. And now the duct tape is frayed and it takes a long time for duct tape to go bad. Mm. Right? <laughs> so if we, if we look at like the, just the Catholic schools as an example, but that's a place where lay people stepped in and ministered and ministered powerfully. There are so many people who have taught in Catholic schools for 30, 40 years, have dedicated their whole careers, their whole lives to Catholic education because they believe in it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you see what, what some of these, these teachers have done. So they've made huge sacrifices. They've sacrificed salary. They've sacrificed all this other stuff. Yeah. And they give generously. And often, I mean, any teacher will tell you this, regardless of what, what kind of school they teach in. Uh, but teachers are, are among those people who are, are really called upon to be super generous. Yes. To give extra time, yeah. uh, more of themselves than, than they normally do, invest heavily in the lives of, of people mm -hmm. who are not their own family. Yeah. It's very, very powerful. So I have huge, huge respect for it. But this is, this is one of the things, right? If they're doing this, have we, have we fixed some of the other things that are present in that system, in the schools. So I have a question about Catholic schools because what I noticed with a particular school was you needed more revenue in order to pay more teachers. And so some of these Catholic schools become more privatized. Yeah. And so you then lose Catholic identity. And well, you can, you, you'll end up doing a couple of things. You'll lose some of the Catholic identity because you're taking whatever tuition you can yeah. from whoever you can. Yeah. But you also end up pricing yourself out of the the range of many people who would like to send their kids to Catholic school. Oh, gosh, school. yeah. And so in sort of a strange way, that desire to go and we need to get out of the schools so that we can serve the poor ended up creating a whole class of, of people who can't get, who can't afford a Catholic mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. because you were providing it for them. Yeah. That was your service to the poor. Mm -hmm. Right. And now that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that we can, of course, there's so many ways we can serve the poor. Right. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't serve the poor. Yeah. We absolutely have to serve the poor, but education is one of the most important things. And sometimes we have to recognize that, uh, just because people have a certain level of income. I, I, I know a family who uh, their level of income technically meant that they couldn't qualify for financial aid. But if they sent all of their kids to a Catholic school, they they couldn't possibly afford it wow. on the income that they had. So technically their income was just at this level where financial aid was not something that they were eligible for. Right. But they could only send one kid to Catholic school if wow. they were going to do it that way. Well, that that's a problem. Yeah. Right. So we've got to, we've got to figure. See, these are things that we've got to figure out with finances and stuff. But more important, I'm thinking about like the the people who go in and and do this work, because they end up being asked to do far more than sometimes is is reasonable. Mm -hmm. And I think as a as a pastor, I want to be sensitive to it. And I've been thinking about this. Am I sensitive enough to the needs of the lay staff that give so generously here? You know, and I, you can tell me that I am. That's fine. I don't mind it being recorded. I mean, I, I mean, I'm grateful that you <laughs> listen to me when I come to you, and then you say but, I had no idea. Yeah. So I mean, like we had an awesome conversation. You know, me coming to you with a specific need, and you like 
not having to deal with like lay people things on, you know, on, on the regular, um, you heard me out, you made a change and I was like, cool. But that was important. I think what you did was, I mean, I was kidding. I wasn't actually looking for compliments, but I appreciate it. Oh, no, 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 no. It's good. <laughs> you, you listened and you received what I had to say. Yeah. Um, see, this, this and is... so there's a cry from the lay people in the church asking for certain things that the church isn't responding to. Well, you mean lay people working for the church? Right, lay people working for the church. I'm yeah. sorry, lay people working for their church. Um, I think in the last maybe we'll call it on 20 years. I don't know. I've been in ministry professionally for 10 years. Yeah. But well, so, and, and one of the things that this again this has been talked about in lots of other places. I'm not presenting an original thought. No, no. This you is. Know, the I don't want to get accused of plagiarism or anything. Yeah. But like, one of the things that that often happens is we, we sort of professionalize ministry. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have the, the degree that says that I can do this ministry, uh, or if I don't have this or that, whatever it might be, then I'm not a ministry professional, therefore I'm not qualified to do it. Or only those who are already working in this, only those who have the job title and mm -hmm. get paid for it are qualified to do this. And therefore the, that volunteer ministry attitude kind of disappears. Mm. Right. So people who might might be willing to volunteer look and they see, oh, we've got a staff member who who does this kind of stuff. Maybe I shouldn't try to do anything because they've they've hired somebody. I couldn't get a job doing this. <laughs> you know? Well, there's lots of things I couldn't get a job doing. <laughs> you know? That doesn't mean I, I, I shouldn't like volunteer my help. Anyway, mm -hmm. I, I, I just worry sometimes that we if we over professionalize, uh, we're creating a problem where we discourage people from stepping into the ministry that's proper to their state of life. Right. So as a priest, there are certain ministries that are proper to my state in life. Being a priest means that I minister most especially sacramentally. Mm -hmm. And so by celebrating the sacraments, I am fulfilling an enormously important part of my ministry that is given to me by my state in life. Right. Right. A lay person can step into various ministries. There's lots of things that lay people can do in the life of the church to serve and and to work. If you're going to do that and that's going to be your your job, that's that's fine. St. Paul says that the laborer deserves his payment. Mm -hmm. right? So we have to we have to make sure that people are compensated and, and paid well. Mm -hmm. um, it, it shouldn't be a in the same way that a priest is ministering uh, and is not exactly living luxury. Although this is the thing that I always laugh about is that like, as a priest, I always figured, okay, there's going to be simplicity of life. There's going to be uh, a certain level of, of poverty. And, you know, I don't have the highest salary on the staff, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which, you know, I, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, but in my life as a priest, I, I have lived primarily in Fairfield, and, Greenwich. and in Greenwich, <laughs> I, I have lived in neighborhoods that I have no business living in according to my salary. Uh, and I have, I have been extraordinarily blessed in that regard. Right. Uh, it's not because of anything that, that I've done, nor is it anything that I expect. Mm -hmm. It's just something that has, that has happened. It's the way that my, my assignments have worked out. But yeah. All right. All of that. Like, are we doing ministry so that we can make money? And I think anytime somebody's doing the ministry just for the sake of the money, just for the paycheck, mm -hmm. their heart can't possibly be in the right place. No. And I don't mean to judge anybody with that, but right. just like the, the, the reality is if if the bottom line is your salary, uh, then there there might not be something spiritually healthy there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if you have no concern about your salary, then there might not be something especially healthy there either. Right. right? Exactly. <laughs> like a yes. lay person has responsibilities and, right. and needs to make a plan for their life. So, and, and I think this is where, um, I think in, even in focus, for example, I heard that they raised their minimum that missionaries have to fundraise that when I was a missionary. Okay. So like your minimum, you had to bring in at least like 1800 a, a month. Um, now they bump that up to like 2,500. So at least your salary is like a minimum of like 40 to 50 a year. Because they realize, oh, you're worth, like, you would, the work that you're doing is worth it. And so you really need to be compensated for that. Right. Um, so I was really happy to hear that there was a switch then when I left. It's like, oh, that's that's actually really good because uh, you need to pay your stuff. And, you know, you don't want to be leaving focus and be put into, like, a really difficult situation because, right. you know, like, you couldn't afford to, you know, pay student loans or whatever. Um and just, I think the, the nature of like religious and priests different from lay people, lay people have to like live, they have to pay rent, they have to like provide for a family. Right. So all those needs are taken care of. Um, and so to have members in the lay people working in the church to really voice um, their needs, like in order for me to do ministry 
and, and especially if people are called to ministry, um, it is a very hard thing to then have to get to a point to wrestle. Do I leave working for the gospel because I have to learn how to provide for my family yeah. and how to provide for my future? And it is it is a tug of war and it hurts um, to discern like, oh, I, I can't do this. Like, I literally can't do this. But I also don't want to leave the work that I know Jesus has called me to, like the work that I believe I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life. Um, so lay people are speaking up more about their needs, but making it aware to, I guess, like the priest that they're working for or, you know, the different community, like higher ups, I guess, within the church. And yeah. there's just there just isn't. There isn't that knowledge, though. Well, there's there's to other an extent things, like, in different spaces. Yeah, and, and that's that's kind of talking about it on the financial level. Yeah, like we've, we've got to make sure that we're giving just mm. payment and everything. But I, I'm thinking even even more basically, right? The fact that I live here, mm-hmm. the fact that I'm up early, the fact that I'm I'm unlocking the doors here early in the morning, um, the fact that I am available throughout the day because that's that's my job. There's today. an emergency my, phone in your room. Yeah, exactly. It's my it's my vocation to do that. Yeah. This is what God called me to, and by virtue of the fact that I'm a priest, I'm supposed to do all of this. But do we priests sometimes forget that the the lay staff and lay ministers who work with us? are not called by, to do to do that in the same way. Right. If you're waking up at four in the morning to take care of your baby. Right. And you know? there is, of course, a generosity that I think comes with the territory. Mm-hmm. Right. And and an, an expectation of self gift and sacrifice that comes with the territory. If you're going to I mean this is what uh what is it, Sirach, chapter two. Mm. But my son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for trial. Mm. He's not talking about ordained ministry. He's just saying if you come, if you prepare yourself to if you if you're planning to come and serve, mm. uh, be prepared for trial, for difficulty, for the need to make sacrifice. This is this is it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a certain amount of yeah, it comes with the territory. Yeah, fine, we can agree that that's fine. That's not a big deal. But <laughs> with that, is the expectation unreasonable sometimes? Like do do priests sometimes forget this? Do religious forget this? Do lay people forget this? Mm-hmm. That there's there, there's only so much that I can ask of somebody who's who's working here uh, to do. Uh, there's only so much time they have that they they need their their time off. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because I'm bad at taking my time off does not mean that everybody else needs to be bad at taking their time <laughs> off. Right? But like really truly, yeah, I I can't I can't use myself as the as as the model for that. You're the worst. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm bad at it. But that that also means like I can't expect that everybody else is going to do the same thing that I do. Right. You know, then I'm Scrooge. Remember, like he doesn't want to give Bob Cratchit the day off on Christmas because <laughs> mm-hmm. because he just wants he to himself come in would yeah because he's going to come in and work. So he why should anybody else get the day off? Yeah. Um, but I I can't I can't be that guy. Mm-hmm. And I've I've got to be careful of that. Um, at, at the same time, like what's what's the balance and and how do you how do you foster that while helping people to live out their true vocation? Mm-hmm. And understanding their ministry is something that supports their vocation. Right. Their ministry is something that blesses their vocation. Their ministry is something that serves and supports my vocation. And can be integrated. Right. So like when you minister, you support what I'm supposed to be doing as a priest. Mm-hmm. And so there's there's a teamwork. And and I'm I've been convinced of this for a very long time. Like I, I think too often in, in the life of the church we talk about sort of opposition between uh, clergy and lay people or or the, the institutional church and the, your ordinary parish or something like that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, 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 we're, we're a team. We're, yeah. working, we're working together and we're supposed to be. There's not a contradiction. Uh, there's not an opposition between vocations. The vocations are complementary. Yes. We need to work together. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, I need to remember that just because the vocations are complementary, just because the ministries are complementary, ordained ministry and lay ministry are complementary, they go together. Uh, too often we think that they're somehow opposed and that this is like lay empowerment or it's clericalism. If, if like th- th- This will happen all the time, especially with liturgy. Like if the priest says, I'm going to distribute communion, somebody will say, that's clericalism, lay people should be doing it. It's like, no, actually it's the priest's job. Who the church, says that? oh, it, it was a thing. It's it's not so much said very often anymore. But oh like, gosh. That's, like, that's a little bit of a, a, a longstanding wound that you from have? like my time in formation. Really? Yeah, that, that was that was actually an attitude that was out there. No yeah. way. Yeah. Well, th- like the idea that that all liturgical ministry needed to be shared equally. What? It's actually no the, the That's priests, why you have a priest. That the priest's reason for existing is, is liturgy. The liturgy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um to to help people to find Christ through that. So right. these are things that like it's it's really important. But all right. It's like a weird form of justice. 
twisted. So justice actually is, I think, very much what's needed. Right. Justice, but then also true discernment. So justice in terms of what we do for the people who minister. Right. How do we take care of them? So I think the thing that we're both thinking about that Mm -hmm. we told the people we would tell them. (laughs) They're like, what is it? About the fact that a, an, an embarrassingly small number of dioceses around the country provide four out of for 176 dioceses provide for paid parental leave. 12 week paid parental leave. Yeah. Only four dioceses out of 176 in the United States. Well, that they're able to actually confirm do that. Yes, true. Now, it might be possible that, like, on a. On a Some of them have been unconfirmed. The Diocese yeah. of Bridgeport is unconfirmed. But there's also, like, that's that could be for employees of the diocese. I think those it, were for that yeah. that the so, diocese cause, cause itself there's a employs. Then, yeah, because there's there's a difference when when you have state. an employee of the diocese yeah. or uh, an employee of of a parish. Yeah. Right. So a parish might be providing that, yeah. but the diocese might not have that as as a rule. Here's here's a thing. All right, and this isn't to make excuses, but this is one of the first times in the history of the church. I mean, or. I shouldn't say the first time, but we're we're at a point now. First of all, societally, where we understand the importance of that paid time off mm-hmm. for people who are just having children, mm-hmm. both especially mothers, but also fathers. That's a societal thing that we're coming to understand now in a way that we never understood before. Right, and it's good that we're understanding it. Mm-hmm. We're at a unique moment in the life of the church because it's the first time where we actually have people who might need paid parental time off to start their families. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that because primarily these ministries were taken care of by priests and religious people who were not having children. (laughs) Right. Right. So it's a, it's a function in part of just, we haven't caught up with some of this. The the first thing was if we're going to hire lay people, okay, how do we take care of their insurance? How do we take care of, of their salary and make sure that they're, they're getting a competitive and just wage. Now, add to that the fact that some of those those lay employees are going to start having children and families and everything, which, hey, we're, we're Catholic. We should be all about that. Pro-family, yeah. pro-life. Super pro-family. This is great. This is mm-hmm. wonderful. We've got to figure something out with that. Mm-hmm. All right, so that's the justice question. Right. So there's the question of how do we justly give to people what they what they need to provide for their needs to, to, to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. Then there's another practical question, which is what do we ask of people? Like putting the financial question aside, what do we ask of people who are going to minister in the life of the church, priests or lay people or religious, what are we asking of them? And is what we're asking of them in this ministry reasonable? Mm. Is it healthy for their state in life? Mm -hmm. Does it foster their growth and holiness? And does it help them to serve the the real needs of people? Because if you're burned out, and I'm telling you, you've got to go out and give four talks today uh, to this group. Or if I'm burned out and I'm being told you've got to go and meet with this this person who's who's struggling. Yeah. Am I am I going to be good to them? Mm. Is my ministry going to really serve them? Is your ministry really going to serve them? No. I mean, it's going to be a really crappy job, and yeah. you hope the Holy Spirit takes over and fixes <laughs> right. everything you so did then, wrong. <laughs> so then. And in, in ministry, what's what's reasonable for us to ask of people and to, to ask of our ministers? How do we do that the right way? And then hmm. I think just on, on the spiritual level, how do we make sure that people who are ministering in the life of the church are are taking care of their spiritual lives and taking care of them? I don't have answers to this. Yeah. So I think these these are the things to like to really pray with and for us to, to think about seriously. You know what? There was um there's a priest that I know who puts it in uh, what does he do? I think for them, for the members, like the people at the school, they have the ability to go and use money as part of their budget to take a yearly retreat somewhere. I, I love was, it. That was like, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, that's great. That's part of your liturgy budget. He's like, yeah, because they need Jesus. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, wow. And that's the very thing. So, for example, you know, as we're doing this retreat here. <laughs> I have not received it yet. I've been like running around nonstop. And the MC looks at me. She goes, I really want you to sit down tomorrow. And I was like, I might be able to. But it just kind of stunk because I was hoping that like the first night I was able to just sit and receive the whole thing. We were, I didn't get to until like the last 20 minutes. 
So today you will. I hope so. Today you will. I hope so. No, I'm gonna make sure. But I mean, but that is that. That's the thing, though. I think if if there's those spaces where you know, like taking that yearly retreat, like to be reminded of your relationship with the Lord and be renewed in your call and your mission. Yeah. Um, that's probably the most fruitful thing a lay minister in the church needs is, um, where is like how is that being given to them? Right. Um, and obviously coming out of the pandemic, it's been harder to find some retreats. Sure. Yeah. Sure. The one that but I, that's, I think that that's where understanding the need for time off, mm -hmm. uh, the need to give people that space is so, is so important. So all of this just comes down to, I think that first understanding that ministry, we've got to have an attitude that it's complementary. Yeah. That we're working together. We're, we're trying to pull in the same direction. Mm -hmm. We're kingdom oriented. We're, we're looking forward to heaven. We mm -hmm. want to get souls into heaven and, and mm -hmm. we're, we're on the same team doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, we also want to like, just remind each other to be mindful of what we can actually expect of one another. Right. You know, and then I would say even like to, to people who are coming to people who are seeking out ministry, who need to be ministered to, um, th this is one of those, like, just, just remember that priests, religious lay ministers, no matter what we are in terms of our state in life, we are humans with limitations, you know, and, and you're as, not, as humans, with you're not limitations, a superhuman. I'm trying so hard, but as, as, as humans with, with limitations, there, there are certain things we're just not going to be able to do. There's limitations no and, and life. Yeah. All of those things. And, and so we've got to, we, I think we've got to give ourselves permission to have that. Yeah. Like, I, I need to give myself permission sometimes to be a limited human being. Wow. Put that on a mug. <laughs> Actually, I could see you walking around with that mug. Like, I, I need to remember that I need to give myself that permission because I get frustrated that I can't do all the stuff that I need to do. Yes. You know, it's, yes. it's easy to do. But this is this is the thing that when we do this ministry, like these are these are things I think for, for us to consider for the sake of the church. And how do we how do we come to solutions about this? Because there's there's justice that that's needed there. Uh, but spiritually to, to recognize that the complementarity yeah, there's no that competition we're, that here. We're working together, and this is so important. Right. There's, I mean, I don't feel like you're asking me crazy things. <laughs> well, no, and, and I, I would, <laughs> I, I would like to, that. I would like to think that I don't ask you crazy don't. things of you. You don't. But, but even so, I think again, as as a church, this is the kind of thing we need to foster. Not asking crazy so, things. So, so that our, I think I think that has to do with like regular communication, though, regular check in. Yeah. You know, and having a space where. Hey, just kind of, I have the freedom and I know that there's particular spaces where like, if I need to air something out, I need to talk about it. I can yeah. do that. But see, I, that's, that's a good practical application. I don't disagree with you at all. Right. I'm thinking practicalities. Yeah. yeah. But I think there's also got to be, and, and this might be a, a source for theological reflection. I don't know. I might need to like sit down and write out some thoughts about it, but like, what is our theological understanding of, of ministry? Because a, a theology that underlies the, the ministry part, understanding how lay ministry and, and clerical ministry are different. Wasn't that in Pope Paul VI encyclical? Uh, uh, I, I don't know which encyclical you're talking about. Well, there's a whole thing where well, they so, talk about the role of the laity. Yeah, well, so there's, there's in Lumen Gentium talks about the role of the laity. I think it's Vatican that one. Too. Yeah. Um, but then there's also but that's in been, the 60s, so it's not fleshed out as much as it like. Right. There's also been, been there's been a few documents. There's ones called Coworkers in the Vineyard of the Lord. It's about lay ecclesial ministry. It's the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops put it out. Okay. Um, it's nice. It doesn't really say much, but it kind of. It's lofty gives, with words, but nothing practical. Yeah, it, it gives some stuff about uh, what lay ministry looks like. It's fine. There's okay. again nothing wrong with it. Right. Um, but there, I think that it, this is an important thing for the church to just keep reflecting on. Um, because it's it's constantly evolving. All right, mm -hmm. I got to wrap up here. Oh, you have a hard out. Yeah, I got I got to get out. Okay, that's fine. Amen. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate this because th there's a lot there, and like, did we solve the problem? Today? No, no, we solved nothing. We solved nothing. We're we just solved brought nothing. It, but I think, this is this is an awareness podcast. Yeah, and very truly, like yeah, an awareness people, podcast. Maybe to say, people are probably not aware. Well, and like a call to us as a church to say we need to we need to reflect really seriously on. Uh, on how we understand ministry, how we treat our ministers. Mm -hmm. um, we also need to make sure that those who are responsible, so like me as a pastor, I need to make sure that I'm paying attention to the needs of all of you who minister with me, right? And, and who walk with me in this. Uh, and then I think this is also a call to people who may not be formally involved in any kind of ministry to say, 
there's a lot you can do Mm -hmm. to, to minister even without having the job title. Right. You don't need Uh, to have a title to minister. There's, there's such a need, uh, and understanding that, that, and ministry is sometimes even the wrong word. It's like, we need you to volunteer. We need you to be willing to serve. Wait, why is ministry the wrong word? So ministry applies primarily to those who are in the community, mm-hmm. right? And apostolate applies to those who are outside. So like people who aren't like, we do apostolate. We go out carrying out work outside of our parish community. Okay. We do, we do ministry to the members of our own parish community. Okay. Right. Um, and sometimes ministry has, because ministry is rooted in a deeply spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think of ministry exclusively as a spiritual ministration. Mm -hmm. So I'm praying with you, praying for you, giving you spiritual advice, giving you spiritual insight. And I might not have that, but so we, we sometimes use ministry as too broad a blanket when like what I really need is I need volunteers to set up chairs, <laughs> <laughs> right? And sure, if, if you want to talk about that as ministry, we can, but <laughs> you're setting up chairs and let's start there. Before before we make this a ministry, let's just talk about the fact that you're setting the up chair chairs. chair ministry. <laughs> but it's, an, it's important. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. I'm not knocking it. But let's before we before we make it this this great lofty thing. Let's just talk. You know about what chairs thing. also mean, right? People who set up chairs. No. If a single Christian guy ever really wants to impress a girl, just they, picks up multiple chairs. Yeah, who can pick up the most look chairs how many at chairs once? Chairs I can carry. Exactly. I'm definitely husband material. Exactly. <laughs> that is a man of God right there. Look oh how much he can goodness. carry. On that joking happy aside. Note, on that happy note. Yes. Paula, thank you. You're welcome. This is Rural like the Lamb. I'm Paula Pena. Paula Sam Kachuba. God bless you.